Alright, so konting review lang ng pinag-aaralan natin. We're learning about the uh, churches of the New Testament. And we have seen a number of them already. Although we haven't really focused on anyone in particular. Maybe a little bit about Antioch. But after we do this general survey, I'm I want to highlight some of the churches and show you strengths and weaknesses. And then we'll wrap up our series on the New Testament churches or the New Testament church. And I hope that as we're studying the New Testament churches, you're beginning to see or you will begin to understand that church is God's number one program. It's not just his number one program for this day and age. The church or the local New Testament biblical church is exclusively the only thing that God is concerned with in our day and age as far as worshiping the Lord, as far as serving the Lord, as far as uh, being evangelistic, uh, minded, being missions minded, being discipleship oriented, uh, being word uh, focused. <clears throat> it doesn't matter if it's evangelism or discipleship. God's uh, exclusive agency for ministry is basically the New Testament church. You know, uh, God doesn't, you know, there's not any other institution on earth that is concerned about people's souls. <laughs> okay? Uh, there's not any other organization on earth that's concerned about the worship of God. Okay? You can go to the bank. <laughs> uh, they're concerned about money. They're not concerned about souls. Okay? Uh, you can go to the government agency. Don't know why you would go there, but if you had to go there, they're concerned about ordinances and permits and uh, 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 yeah, papers and uh, birth certificates, marriage licenses, and all that. Uh, yun ang concern ng government agency, no? Hindi sila concern sa kaluluwa ng tao, kalagayan ng espiritual na tao, no? They don't care about the soul. They don't care about hit singing unto the Lord, you know? There's only one institution that's interested in the worship of God and that God ordained. And that is the New Testament assembly of baptized disciples. So don't forget that as we're going through this, we're seeing this. This is what Paul and Barnabas did in their first missionary journey. This is what Paul and Silas, Timothy and Luke did in their second missionary journey. And now we're looking at Paul in his third missionary journey. And uh, <clears throat> let's go ahead and uh, uh, turn your Bibles to uh, let's turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. And uh, let's look at verse number 22. Acts chapter 18, verse number 22. This is after he sailed from Ephesus. He's returning to Jerusalem. Then he goes back to Antioch. And, uh, and when, verse 22, Acts chapter 18, verse 22, and when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And so the church that's referring there in Caesarea, there's a church in Caesarea, Philip, uh, Caesarea Maritima. Now that would be over here. Okay, I need to see that. Just, I want to see if I could see that, so. Keep it like that for me. Okay, so that would be Caesarea would be here. Oh, make sure that Caesarea would be over here. So that would be Caesarea. And then he would go to uh, <clears throat> Jerusalem and then he would go to Antioch in Syria. 
okay? So let me see. Okay, I, I, we, we can see everything here. That's a good thing. All right, so Caesarea, nanggaling siya sa Ephesus. Tapos nag-travel siya, pumunta siya sa Caesarea, at matapos na mag-confirm siya sa mga churches sa Caesarea, sa Jerusalem. Jerusalem would be here. Uh, umuwi siya sa Antioch, and now he's returned to Antioch. Verse 23, Acts chapter uh, Acts chapter number 18, verse 23. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening the disciples. So he now begins his third missionary journey, and he doesn't realize it, but this will be the last time that he will see Antioch. He's going to leave Antioch and never go back to Antioch. He doesn't, I don't think he knows that. He probably anticipates doing a whole thing of ministry and then going back to Antioch like he normally would, but the circumstances will change for Paul. So he departs from Antioch and he returns to southern Galatia. Now, remember, when we talk about Paul's first missionary journey, what is the geographic land that you should, you should remember in your mind? His first missionary journey relates to what? Southern, southern Galatia. This portion here, southern Galatia. His second missionary journey, you should think of what? Corinth. His Greek and Macedonian uh, ministries here, and there's Corinth. And now as we begin the third missionary journey, you should think Ephesus. He spends a lot of time in Ephesus. He actually spends three years, the longest that he spent anywhere in any of the churches. He spends a lot of time in his third missionary journey in Ephesus. And from Ephesus, he would go to the Macedonian churches, Go back to Ephesus, and back from Ephesus, he would try to encourage some of the churches around here, and then go back again here, and then head back to Ephesus, and then they would finally, he would um, depart from there, depart from Miletus, and then head back to Jerusalem one last time, and then from Jerusalem, he's going to make his way to Rome. Rome is not on our map today because we'll, uh, I don't know if we can, we'll talk about Rome a little bit today, maybe. So anyway, <clears throat> but uh, just to give you a, a reminder, first missionary journey, Southern Galatia. Second missionary journey, Corinth, Greece. Third missionary journey, Ephesus. That's the headquarters, but all of them are churches, you know. Uh, he's been doing that for the churches. So, mm. all right. Hmm. Okay, I see where it is. And that'll be very important for later. Okay. All right. So he starts from Antioch. And he makes his way to southern Galatia in order. He preaches, he encourages the churches in Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. And then he makes his way to Ephesus and he lands there. And uh, what does he find in Ephesus? He finds opposition. He finds opposition. And there's three oppositions to Paul. He's got the problem with the Ephesian disciples. Uh, and we read about that in Acts chapter 19, right? The 12 who had no idea that the Holy Spirit of God was given, all right? All they knew was that they were disciples of, they said they were disciples of John the Baptist, but I don't think they were good disciples at all because they're not saved. <laughs> they didn't even know about the Holy Spirit. And uh, did John the Baptist teach and preach about the Holy Spirit? Did he? 
Yes, he did. In fact, he told the disciples that Jesus Christ will come and Jesus Christ will baptize them in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and so these disciples were not good listeners. <laughs> they, they're not saved. Okay, uh, And so Paul witnesses to them, tells them about the, uh, the gospel. They receive the Lord as their Savior. Then they receive the Holy Ghost. And then, uh, along with the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit of God, they were given gifts, and they were able to prophesy and preach. Now, does the Holy Spirit uh, give us prophetic gifts today? No, he doesn't give us speaking in tongues and, and prophecies. That doesn't happen now. Uh, but does the Holy Spirit of God give gifts to the believers? Yes. Every believer has one gift that God, the Holy Spirit, bestows upon you at the point of your salvation. And I'm not gonna, we're not going to do a study on the spiritual gifts today, but maybe sometime in the future we can talk about the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit has given to every believer. And why would the Holy Spirit give every believer a gift? So they can use it to serve the Lord. Where? In the church. Oh my. Uh, I don't want to get in a rabbit trail. <laughs> look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Let's just look at this real quick. And then we'll get back to our study. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I'll just make one point about it. Concerning the spiritual gifts. <clears throat> okay. Spiritual gifts are given. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. For a purpose. It's to be. It's to edify the church. <clears throat> it's to bless the church. And so if you're saved, God gives you a gift. You're supposed to use the gift in service to the church. Uh, look over in 1 Corinthians here, 14. I want to see that verse that says, to profit with all. Where is that? To profit with all. Do you see that in 1 Corinthians 14, anybody? 1 Corinthians 14, to profit with all. Where is that? You don't see it? Is that the beginning of the verse? It should be. Look, look. Let's look. <laughs> to profit with all. This is this not part of my notes, but I know <laughs> that I want to point this out because this is a very important point when we think about the, the spiritual gifts. And the key word there is with all. Okay. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Yeah. That, that would make sense. 1 Corinthians chapter seven. 12 and verse number 7. Look at what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. You know, with all, the word with all there means to profit the whole, to profit everyone. Uh, and uh, every man here, it's referring to every man who's a member of the church that Paul was has written this letter to. So who is this letter? Where is this found? First Corinthians. Oh, do we have Corinthians here? Corinth. Corinth is right here. So when Paul wrote First Corinthians, the church at First Corinth, uh, the, the church at Corinth was having problems with the spiritual gifts. And Paul wants to correct that problem and teach them that, hey, God didn't give you spiritual gifts so you can walk around proud. 
And you can think, wow, I'm very special because, man, I have the gift of prophecy. And the other person, oh, I have the gift of interpretation. Well, you can't, you can speak in tongues, but if without me, you're you nothing, you know. So they were proud because they were given spiritual gifts. And Paul is saying, no, wait a minute. God gave you a spiritual gift. Every man, every member of this church is given a spiritual gift so you can profit with all. You can edify the body of Christ. And so if you if you want to know what your spiritual gift is, we'll have to make a study of that sometime in the future. All right, so let's go back to Acts chapter number... Uh, let's go to ch Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. So he has opposition from the 12 uh, uh, Ephesian disciples who got who did not know about uh, the Holy Spirit, and now they know about the Holy Spirit. Now they were saved and baptized and added to the church at Ephesus, and they were gifted by the Holy Spirit of God, and they used their gifts to the edification of this church at Ephesus. And so, uh, <clears throat> so this is interesting. Paul was is now in Ephesus, and now the second opposition to Paul came basically from... Uh, when he preached in the synagogue, he would preach in the synagogue and some of the Jews uh, did not like what he had to preach and they caused a stir, <laughs> okay? And they became a problem. And uh, But uh, look basically here at uh, verse number 10, uh, Acts chapter 19, verse number 10. And this continued by the space of two years. And so all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. This, uh, so Paul had a powerful preaching, teaching ministry at Ephesus to the point where all of Asia, and this would be Asia here, all of Asia affected by Ephesus, they heard the preaching, the, the gospel of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, what happens when people hear the good news of Jesus Christ? They get convicted. Some get saved. And what happens when they get saved? Is, is, it, is that it? They just get saved and they're gone? No. They get what? Baptized. And then after they're baptized, what do they do? They are members of a New Testament biblical church. So it could very well be. And the understanding at this time is that as Paul was ministering in Ephesus, churches were planted like the church at Colossae. <clears throat> the church at Colossae. That would be between here and there. So I would put Colossae over here. Okay. Coloss Colossians. The church at Colossae. Church at Colossae, uh, there's a church at Thyatira, you remember Thyatira, Lydia was from Thyatira, <clears throat> so she's here as a businesswoman. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's a church in Thyatira. I think she had something to do with that. And also, uh, Epaphras had something to do with this church over here. Laodicea comes about here. And so more churches uh, are being planted as a result of that. Uh, Philadelphia here. I'll just put Philadelphia here. Sardis here. Smyrna. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar to you? Mm -hmm. uh, the churches of Revelation. Revelation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're around here. 
you see? And this is during the third missionary journey, most likely Philemon, Epaphras, had something to do with Laodicea and Colossae, and uh, Lydia and Epaphras had something to do here. Uh, Titus, you remember there's Timothy and Titus. Uh, Titus was used uh, to establish the churches uh, of uh, Crete. We'll look at that later. Anyway, so uh, uh, look at uh, Acts chapter 19, verse 22. Acts chapter 19, verse 22. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him. He sent Timotheus, Timothy, and Erastus to Macedonia. So they were trying to edify the churches of Greece. But he himself stayed in Asia for a season. But Paul himself stayed. So <clears throat> Timothy and Erastus was there. T uh, Paul was here. And Luke uh, is probably most likely at Philippi <clears throat> or elsewhere or with Paul. <clears throat> anyway, look at uh, Acts chapter number uh, Well. Not only did he get opposition from Jews, not only did he get opposition from false disciples, he also got opposition from idolaters, the idolaters of Ephesus. Okay, now in Ephesus, they had they had one goddess that they really worshipped, the goddess Diana. Now in the encyclopedia, the world's encyclopedia, it's Artemis. In the Bible, it's Diana, but it's the same goddess. And uh, it's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, this temple, this great temple of Diana. And uh, this temple is so massive that the marble floors got excavated. They found the marble floors. She had columns that are 60 feet high. Marble columns, 60 feet high. This is a massive super structure temple building dedicated to Diana. And, uh, and, the, 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 and if you can imagine, the worshipers of Diana, some of them repented and got saved and, and got baptized and joined the church at Ephesus. And they no longer go to the temple of Diana to worship. <clears throat> now, let me make a point here. Let me make a point. Okay, let's say goodbye to the, <laughs> to the geography here for now. <clears throat> so, the Temple of Diana <clears throat> had massive superstructure. Let's say this is her temple. Oh, I'm terrible drawing here. <clears throat> she had. 60 foot columns. It would look like this, something like that. This massive temple of Diana. <clears throat> and people would be there to worship Diana. Big building. And uh, Paul, they would meet at the school of Tyrannus. The church would meet at a house, probably, now I don't know how to build it, make a cube here, a house, okay, a small house. <clears throat> that would be the house that they would worship the Lord in. Now, <clears throat> when... When people think, where can I find the truth? Where can I, where is the pillar and ground of the truth? Where is the house of the living God, not of Diana? I want the house of the living God. I want the way, the truth, and the life. Where can I hear the preaching and teaching of the word of God? Will I find it in this big, huge temple of Diana? Or am I going to find it in this little house where Paul is ministering and believers are assembling? You see what I'm saying? 
You understand what I'm saying here? I'm saying the size of a building is not the church. The size of the congregation is, is not the deciding factor about a church. You see, the question is, where can you hear the word of truth? Where can you hear the worship of the Lord? <clears throat> oh, I think I'm... I wonder I'm having problems. Am I still being seen? And where is the truth? Is it in this little house? Maybe? Or is it in the big temple of Diana? Huh? It's in the house. Which is the pillar of, of the pillar of the uh, the pillar and ground of truth? This or this? A small meeting place. <laughs> so don't be discouraged. <clears throat> If you look at, you know, I look at Tuktukan, I see a huge Mormon temple. I see the nice big kingdom hall of the Jehovah Witnesses. I look at the Iglesia Ni Cristo building. I see the Roman Catholic Santa Ana Church, huge. <clears throat> Any of them? The Church of the Living God? No. <laughs> Where is, if I went to Ephesus and I said, hey, where can I find the house of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth? Where can I go? You go here, right? If I go to Tuktukan, to Gig City in Tuktukan, where can we find the house of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth? Oh, it's over by when we meet together on Sunday. By the way, we'll meet together this Sunday, Lord willing. Amen. Uh, it's at Mrs. Santos's property, the Church of the Living God. Oh, so it has nothing to do with the big churches, big, big religious organization. I don't even call them churches because they're not an assembly of baptized disciples. They are a religious association. They're a religious group. They're very religious people, but they are not the house of the living God. So anyway, that's something to think about. <clears throat> Look at ch Acts chapter 20. Uh, there's another church at Troas. Right here, you remember? When Paul went to Philippi, he came to, he came to Philippi by the way of Samostratia, Neapolis here. But he, he launched it himself from Troas. Uh, well, two years ago, he was at Troas. He planted a church at Troas. Look over in Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> Acts chapter 20 and uh, verse number 4. And there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, of Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timotheus of Asia, Tychicus, and Trophimus. Verse number 5, Acts chapter 20, verse 5. These going before tarried for us at Troas. So they were at Troas. And uh, verse number six. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days. And we abode seven days. So he was a whole week at Troas with these disciples. And look at verse number seven. And upon the what? The first day of the week when the disciples came Together. So why do we have church on Sunday, the first day of the week? Because that's what the Christians did in the Bible. It's Sunday. It's a special day. I'm not saying you can't have church any other day. You can have church any day. In fact, the Jerusalem church had everyday church services. But there's one day in the week that stands out in the Bible more than any other day that's sacred and important for worshiping God, and that's the first day of the week. <clears throat> and I'm saying a Christian is in sin if he's not in church on the first day of the week. Okay? 
<clears throat> that's biblical. That's the Lord's day. Oh, okay. So, if you're a Christian, move your schedule. Change your schedule. Change your schedule. <laughs> don't act like you're a victim of your calendar. Oh, I don't have time. <laughs> well, nobody has time. <laughs> I'm too busy. If you're too busy for God, you ought to get right with God because he's not too busy to answer your prayer. Oh, my. Come on now. All right. <clears throat> Just preach that one. Look at verse number 17. Acts chapter 20, verse number 17. Acts chapter 20, verse 17. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. This is the saddest, one of the, one of the uh, you know, when you say goodbye to people, uh, it's one of the saddest things you can experience is to say goodbye. Well, Paul had to say goodbye to the brethren in Ephesus. And he called them to Miletus. Miletus would be over here. It's a port. And he gathered them from Ephesus. In fact, some of the other brethren, remember they were at Troas, they, they all met at met Miletus. And he's going to give them their farewell. He's going to say goodbye to all the brethren here. All the brethren here. And uh, he's gonna, he, he knows that he's going to go to Jerusalem. Oh, he took out Jerusalem. <laughs> he's going to go to Jerusalem, and from Jerusalem he's going to go to Rome. And he's going to say goodbye to the brethren here. So Acts chapter 20, verse number 17, is one of the saddest uh, chapters, but it, uh, verses here, but it's very edifying. If you really want to see the heart of Paul, you've got to read Acts chapter 20, verse 17, all the way to the end over there. <clears throat> anyway, look at verse 31. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of how many years? Three years, I ceased not to warn everyone, night and day with tears. Paul was a preacher. He warned everyone with tears. He had a burden for souls. And he, he, uh, he said, I spent three years. So how long was he at Ephesus? The third missionary journey? He was there for three years. All right, and then he goes into uh, Tyre, and then in Tyre, oh, I took out Tyre. <laughs> in Tyre, close to Jerusalem, he finds disciples there. He goes to Ptolemais, he finds disciples there. He goes to Caesarea, Maritima, and he finds disciples there. And then he finally makes his way to Jerusalem, and so on and so forth. So, <clears throat> That's, those are the churches that we find in Paul's third missionary journey. There are other churches, uh, the church at Tyre, the church at Ptolemies. Uh, we mentioned the church at Caesarea and Jerusalem already. There's the churches of Crete over here. Titus ministered in the churches of Crete. Look at Titus chapter 1. Go over to Titus chapter 1, and I'll wrap it up here soon. Titus chapter 1 and verse number 5. Titus chapter 1, verse number 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So uh, Paul tasked Titus with ordaining elders in every city in Crete. Uh, church planting, establishing churches, okay? And so there's that. There's the church at Petulai. Look at Acts chapter 28. As Paul is making his way to Rome. There's a church at Petulai. <laughs> Petulai. Petulai. Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28, verse 13 and 14. Acts chapter 28, verse 13. And from thence we fetched a compass and came to Heragium. And after one day, the south wind blew. And we came the next day to Petuli. 
where we found brethren. And that's basically close to Rome. And then he makes his way to Rome. What does he find in Rome? There is at least six churches in Rome. See, a lot of people think he only went to one church in Rome, the church at Rome. No, he had churches in Rome. Look at Romans chapter 16. This is our last passage for tonight. Romans chapter 16. As he uh, writes to Rome. By the way, if there's any questions, please ask them now. And uh, we'll try to get to them. But anyway, Romans chapter 16. Look at Romans chapter 16. Verse number one, I command unto you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Chanchuria. Chanchuria. <clears throat> That's right here. So when he was at Rome, there was a, 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 a girl who served in the church at Chanchuria who ministered to Paul at Rome. And her name was Phoebe, and she's from here. And now she's at Rome. Same with Aquila and Priscilla, too. And so there's a church at Chancheria. We didn't know about that, but it says, which is at Ch the church, which is at Chancheria. So that's an interesting thing. Uh, look at verse number three. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. So remember, Priscilla and Aquila were originally from Rome, and then the rules changed. They kicked out all the Jews, and Priscilla and Aqu Aquila and Priscilla lived in Corinth. And then when Paul came to Corinth for the first time, he lived with Aquila and Priscilla because they were both Jewish and tent makers. And then they, they, uh, they, they were already Christians at Rome. <clears throat> Wonder how that happened. Probably through Pentecost. Anyway, and uh, they accompanied him to Ephesus. Remember that, Aquila and Priscilla? Well, Aquila and Priscilla joins him in Rome <clears throat> while they were already there. <clears throat> And that's a whole other church. Look at verse number five. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Oh, that's Aquila and Priscilla, the church that is in their house, okay? Uh, and again, the church met at the house. You see. Look at verse number 10. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' household. Now, why would the Bible say it like that? Because that was Aristobulus' household church. <clears throat> Look at verse 11. Salute Herodion, my kinsmen. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus. That's a whole other household besides Aristobulus. There is Narcissus and all the people with him. Look at verse number 14. Salute Asyncritus, Felgon, Hermas, Patrobas, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. That's the language of a New Testament biblical church. So along with uh, our, our Asyncritus and Felgon and Hermes and Patrobus and Hermes, there were brethren there. That's a whole separate church. And these are all in Rome. <clears throat> Salute, um, look at verse 15. Salute Philologus and Julia and Nereus and his sister and Olympus and all the saints which are with them. Oh, the saints. That's the language of New Testament assemblies of baptized disciples. One, two, three, four, five, six. At least there are six churches there. And uh, so on and so forth. So we find uh, that God's program for this generation is not the bank, not the government office, not the hospital. We like the hospital. I mean, Hospitals, we're thankful for the hospitals, but they're concerned with the body. They're not concerned with the soul. God's number one program, the exclusive thing that God uses in our day and age to worship Him and to serve Him, is the New Testament biblical assemblies of baptized disciples. Now we're going to look at some more. <clears throat> we're going to look at the seven churches of Asia. Okay, we've had a little bit of introduction here, but we'll look at the seven churches next week. And then after that, we'll go ahead and review all these churches again with the strengths and weaknesses going through that. And uh, hopefully we'll wrap up our series on the New Testament church. All right, no questions. I don't see any questions. Of course, I can't see anything with this anyway. <laughs>
All right, good. Okay. All right, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless them. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that as we uh, look at the life of Paul and some of the servants along with him, that your heartbeat is planting New Testament churches. Thank you, Lord, that you called us to this great task. Thank you, Lord, that you're interested in souls and you're interested in churches being established. Lord, I pray you'd use us, each and every one of us, even those in live stream, Lord, that they would have a burden to be a part of a New Testament biblical church and that they would serve you and that they would look for souls and lead them to the Lord and disciple them and help the churches to grow spiritually, Lord. We love you and thank you and ask that you bless and protect us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.